Hi there, my name is Dr. Sinan, GP and longevity doctor. Today, I thought it would be fun to walk through the Q-Risk tool. This is a really important tool that's used all the time in clinical rooms all across the country. This is a tool that's commonly used in the UK to look and validate the risk of having a stroke or a heart attack in the next 10 years. So there aren't many tools out there that are this accurate, that are based on such a huge, large subset and that have been around for a while. This is called Q-Risk 3 because it's the third iteration. The main aim of this is to say you or X individual, your risk of having a stroke or a heart attack in the next 10 years is X percent. It's very specific and it's based on a whole host of factors that are involved and then add up together to increase the total risk of these major cardiovascular events. A few things just before you start, if you do, this, this tool is only appropriate for people over the age of 25 and under the age of 84 and it's not to be used if you already have a cardiovascular disease, such as you've already had a stroke, you know that you've got angina, you know that you've had a heart attack in the past, for example. This isn't a useful tool for you because if you've already had an event, the risk for you is already higher by virtue of you being someone uh, that is all that, that has already succumbed to the disease and the chance of it happening again is higher. So this tool is appropriate from a primary prevention perspective, understanding risk for most people. Let's dig in. Yep, so we can see on the left here, there's some parameters. All of these parameters, there's about 22 in total, are factors that weigh into the risk of these types of cardiovascular disease. I'm going to walk through them using some of my data, and you can happily play along uh, later or follow me as we go through. So age, 42, male, doesn't actually have my ethnicity. I'm going to put Indian just for the moment, and I'll put a postcode in. Postcode is actually quite relevant because where you live in the country, the level of deprivation for that particular location is relevant to your risk of a whole host of diseases, including cardiovascular risk. So people that live in wealthy areas tend to live longer and have less cardiovascular disease and vice versa. Knowing your postcode is linked to a level of deprivation for a particular area in the country, and it already starts to mold and add into the risk equation for your risk of having a cardiovascular event in 10 years time. So smoking status, I am a, I'm going to put myself as an ex-smoker. Diabetic status, I do not have any diabetes. Smoking, by the way, is probably the highest risk factor. So it's uh, the one thing that if you do in terms of getting maximum bang for buck for your health generally, not even including just cardiovascular risk, that's the one thing that you, if you do it, you should really be aiming to stop. There isn't anything else that you're going to be doing uh, other than stopping smoking that's going to give you the amount of benefit smoking will do. Smoking in the context in the context of cardiovascular risk damages your blood vessels. It makes the arteries harder. It makes the blood vessels damaged. It increases the risk of the first steps of the pathogenesis or the beginning of disease process that causes cardiovascular disease risk. And it massively increases other secondary risk factors as well. So it is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and it increases the risk of other things like blood pressure, which is also independently a risk. So uh, not a good thing to be having when we're thinking about cardiovascular vascular risk. Diabetes, I'm not diabetic. Diabetes is important because again, it's a disease that affects multiple parts of the body because really diabetes is a disease of sugar, excess sugar in the blood. Blood gets everywhere, too much sugar in the blood starts to physically damage blood vessels. Again, this kind of damage directly and indirectly to blood vessels uh, causes the first steps or accelerates the steps of causing disease, which increases the risk of cardiovascular problems, heart attacks and stroke, as well as small vessel disease. So diabetes, you may or may not be aware, massively increases the risk of problems with vision. Small vessels in the eye get damaged because of the sugar. It increases the risk of uh, peripheral nerve problems as well as peripheral flow of blood. Again, sugar in the small vessels in the parts of our body far away from our heart start to get damaged. They get clogged. They start to decrease in the ability of providing oxygen to the tissues. Uh, next thing is looking at angina or heart attack. This is about family history. So I actually do have a family history of cardiovascular disease in someone below the age of 60. That essentially is a proxy for, is there a strong family history of cardiovascular risk? If so, this definitely does increase risk. We don't know whether it's actually a familial history that is relevant to you, i.e. someone that does have a strong family history of cardiovascular disease doesn't necessarily mean they will have cardiovascular disease and vice versa, even if there isn't a, a strong family history. All we know is that if there is a strong family history, and that means someone that is relatively
relatively young, below the age of 60, um, if they have a cardiovascular risk or if they have cardiovascular disease, the chance that other familial members may suffer, assuming they don't have loads of risk factors themselves, or they have a particularly bad lifestyle that's caused their cardiovascular risk, means that it's important to weigh into the equation. The younger that someone has cardiovascular issues, especially things like heart attacks and stroke, the more important and the higher the risk that there could be a genetic component. There is things that can be done about this, but in this situation, uh, it's an important factor that does increase risk. Kidney disease, stage three, four or five. So the kidney is a really important organ uh, for managing toxins. It's also an important organ uh, that relies very heavily on a constant flow of blood to produce urine, but also the constant flow of blood under a particular pressure. So the pressure at which blood goes to the kidney is so important that the kidney itself is in involved in actually managing the blood pressure around the body, but especially the pressure at which blood comes is supplied to the kidney. If there's disease in the kidney, which happens with old age, as well as with diabetes, as well as with other kind of chronic or acute kidney diseases, then this affects the hormones that regulate blood pressure. It increases the pressure at which blood ultimately arrives to the kidney, resulting in further damage in a kind of negative cycle. The main thing when it comes to cardiovascular risk here is that turbulence of, of blood pressure. If the blood pressure starts to raise slightly, that means the work of the heart increases. It's pushing all that blood against a stronger force. It needs to work harder over time. It can get tired and it can get damaged. Atrial fibrillation, this is an irregular heartbeat. Normally our heart pumps smoothly and regularly, consistently. Atrial fibrillation is when the heart pumps irregularly. And if you can think about that from the heart perspective, normally the heart beat is generated from within the heart, from, from the sinoatrial node. It causes the heart normally to pump regularly. If you can imagine an irregularity of that heart rate, it causes the it causes a kind of irregular pumping, which causes a kind of whisking effect in the chambers of the heart in which there is blood. If you can imagine whisking blood, pump, irregular pumping, it causes this blood to become hypercoagulable. It causes it to clot easily. Once those clotting effects occur, small amounts of clotted blood can be thrown up into the cardiovascular system and lodge in other parts of the body. Commonly, it lodges in the brain. So for people that have atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke is increased by about five times. So if you have AF, obviously a high risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Blood pressure treatment. I mean, blood pressure itself is a massive, probably one of the top three risk factors for cardiovascular disease. I don't have a high blood pressure. I'm not on blood pressure treatment. Migraines. Migraines is an interesting one. This is a new one. So migraines didn't used to be in Q risk two. This is something new that they've noticed that people that have migraines, especially women, and especially when they have an aura, it does increase the risk of cardiovascular events. We don't know exactly why. Migraines can often be associated with changes in the blood constriction and blood flow within the brain. Also, migraines are independently associated with cardiovascular risk. So if you suffer with migraines, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a massively increased risk of cardiovascular risk. But when you look at it over a population of people, migraine is exceptionally common. Even if there is a small risk over a large number of people, that becomes a big risk. It's worth understanding in your specific context. I don't suffer with migraines, so I'm going to leave that one blank. So migraines, I do not have. Rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. So these are two conditions that are considered kind of connective tissue disease conditions or inflammatory conditions. Rheumatoid arthritis often is thought of as a kind of joint condition. It does certainly cause uh, joint problems and manifestations that we can see externally when we examine. The other thing with rheumatoid arthritis is that it causes whole body inflammation. So it can cause inflammation and swelling of blood vessels. So when that occurs, it basically means damage to blood vessels. Any damage to blood vessels can increase the risk of changes to the blood vessels that cause the first steps of changes that can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, which increases the risk of things like heart problems and stroke. So ultimately, inflammation of blood vessels increases the risk. Uh, similarly with SLE, it's also an inflammatory condition. Uh, this is a condition affecting multiple organs in different ways. It's a complicated condition, but again, it's associated with an increased risk because of its inflammatory properties. Also, there are medications that you take for SLE, which can be associated also with cardiovascular risk. Severe mental illness. I don't suffer with this. Why is severe mental illness associated with an increased risk? Main, the main reason here is people that suffer with severe mental illness, they usually indulge in behaviors that are associated with increased cardiovascular risk, such as smoking, uh, as well as not exercising, as well as not eating a healthy diet. So that's one lifestyle risk associated with the disease. The other thing with mental health is being on an antipsychotic medication. So these are medications uh, that are usually taken for things like schizophrenia and other uh, severe mental health conditions. Uh, the reason why this is a risk is that these types of tablets tend to increase the cholesterol levels, exactly the same reason that regular steroid tablets
supplements are on this list too. For certain conditions, people are on long-term steroid. If you're on that, over time, your cholesterol levels do start to creep up. Cholesterol itself is an independent risk factor and one of the top three risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So anything that increases cholesterol over a long period of time, like chronic medications, then has to be weighed into the equation. A diagnosis or treatment for erectile dysfunction, I don't suffer with that either. Um, this is a new thing that's been added to QRISC-3. This didn't used to be in this Q, in, in the old QRISC-2. The reasons for this are erectile dysfunction is really a kind of proxy for blood flow. So poor blood supply and blood flow, which is needed for an erection. If that's the case, it usually means that there is some compromise to the vessel system. So this is one marker. Again, it's lower down the list. It's not as important as some of the other risk factors, but significant enough to make this list of about 22 parameters. Total number of parameters that are associated with cardiovascular risk probably go up to about 37 or 38. So this is a slightly pared down list and is of relevance and has clinical importance. Uh, the last parameters here are related to weight and cholesterol. So my cholesterol to HDL uh, ratio, I'm going to put that as three. My systolic blood pressure, I'll put as 120. The systolic blood pressure is the pressure at which the heart pumps blood out of the body, not the pressure at which it arrives back. That's the second number. That's the diastolic number. If the pressure at which the heart is pumping blood out is high, i.e. you have high blood pressure, the heart needs to work harder. This is a really important risk factor and also massively underdiagnosed. And for most people, they don't have symptoms for it. My blood pressure uh, for systolic is about 120, which is generally considered to be okay. And the body mass index. What's my weight? Is it, am I appropriate weight uh, for my height? My height is 180. Three, and my weight is 90 kg. Now, once we've pumped all that information in, we can press the button to calculate risk. So these are the results and uh, let's have a look. So it's telling me that my risk of having a heart attack or stroke within the next 10 years is 3.2%. That's actually pretty low. Uh, in other words, in a crowd of 100 people with the same risk factors, three people are likely to have a heart attack or a stroke within the next 10 years. One thing that I find in clinic when we go through this Q-risk is that often hearing a number like 3% or 30% doesn't really mean much. Benchmarking this uh, against other people of a similar age uh, and understanding what it means to them. What, what does a number randomly mean? 3.2% may mean something quite high for some people. Uh, it may mean something really low. So I think uh, in terms of making sense of this, this number itself, as well as what are the things that tend to move the needle in terms of the percentage? First things first, we practically use this as uh, to understand risk and then quantify what behavior change needs to be done from a lifestyle perspective, as well as the potential need uh, for medications. So anything above 10%, i.e. there's a 10% chance that you're going to have a risk of a heart attack or stroke in 10 years time is a rough ballpark proxy point at which we would start to consider additional medication interventions. Yeah, at any point, we should all be optimizing our heart health and our general health. They are synonymous, lifestyle, exercise, eating right, maintaining in a healthy way, not drinking excess alcohol or not drinking at all. All of these things we should be doing all the time. They really are primary issues. But if you start to find even when you're doing all of those right things that your risk increases, or it's above a 10% threshold, we may need to start medications. The main one is a statin, which is a medication that helps to lower cholesterol levels. Uh, on that point, I guess uh, it's worth differentiating between things we can do, do something about versus things that we can't do something about. We can't do much about our age. We can't do much about our gender or our family history. We can do a hell of a lot about the fact about whether we smoke. We can do a lot about our weight. We can do something about our blood pressure. And we can even do something when it comes to managing certain conditions like my migraine or rheumatoid arthritis. Unfortunately, we can't stop or prevent having those types of conditions, but we can manage them uh, better. Uh, but there's loads that we can do. One, one condition that's particularly important if you have, have it to manage it is diabetes. So I think diabetes is exceptionally common. A lot of people with diabetes will unfortunately go on to suffer with cardiovascular disease. Managing and maintaining a low level of sugar in the blood over a long period of time via the HbA1c metric is really, really uh, important. And it's the difference between mass Massively decreasing risk. And if that sugar parameter is not controlled, the risk naturally goes up. Not everything is created equal in terms of risk. So we've gone over a multitude of parameters. What are the most important ones uh, that we can do something about? So I'd say certainly smoking is top of the list. Certainly cholesterol is a very important parameter. We've just covered a couple of ratios and metrics here. There's loads of metrics that are relevant for cardiovascular risk here. But the ones that are done on the NHS are useful. There are other ones that can be done that are even more useful, such as apolyse 
lipoproteins and some tests that can be done related to genetic risk uh, known as lipoprotein A that can give us a little bit more insight that the NHS doesn't always give on a first screening. The other thing apart from smoking uh, and cholesterol is going to be blood pressure. So knowing blood pressure is the first thing. A lot of people just don't know they have high blood pressure. It's massively underdiagnosed and people don't have symptoms. There's no reason to check it. If you have a family history or if you've never done it before, it's worth doing. If it's normal, great. You just check it once every year or so. If it's high, check it again. Check it morning and evening over four days. Get an average. If it's still high, then discuss with a healthcare professional. Anyway, have a play around with this tool. You can see it at qrisk.org. If you pump some numbers in, and again, remember, you shouldn't have established disease. You should be within that particular age range above the age of 25. If you pump in all your data, as much as you know, you can still go through even if you don't know your cholesterol levels and you start to get numbers over the 10% mark, worth reaching out to your healthcare professional, discussing it in a little bit more detail. Managing, understanding and preventing cardiovascular disease is probably one of the best things we can do for our health. So please use the tool uh, as you need to as a guide and then discuss with a clinician. Many thanks for listening. Many thanks for watching. Do hit that subscribe button. Until next time, take care of yourselves.